Hello, I am Michael Hussey, Dean at Widener Law Commonwealth. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 15th annual John Gettit Lecture, named for the founder of our Law and Government Institute, Emeritus Professor John Gettit. We are delighted to have John and his spouse Carol with us today. Welcome, John. Welcome, Carol. Our Law and Government Institute helps students explore how government works and the roles that lawyers play in making and implementing the law. As a result, our students develop a passion for government law, which in turn leads to Widener Law Commonwealth alumni working in all areas of government law and public service. Our alumni are key to ensuring the rule of law is rightly developed and faithfully implemented. I hope you find today's lecture engaging and thought provoking. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Jill Family, who is the faculty advisor to the Law and Government Institute. Professor Family. Thank you so much, Dean Hussey. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here today. And I just wanted to take a minute to recognize John Gedded, who is here with us this afternoon, and to thank him as we do every year to he and his wife, Carol, for all that they have done, not only in establishing the Long Government Institute, but also for their crucial roles in the creation of our law school period. Um, and so we are very glad to be able to host this lecture every year to honor the work that John has done to make Widener Law Commonwealth what it is, as well as to recognize uh, his role as a mentor to so many of our alums and faculty members as well. So we are so happy to have John here with us. And also real quick, if I may, I just wanna give a shout out to Quinn Yergain, who is also um, with us. And Quinn is going to be joining our faculty in July. Um, and Quinn very much will be following in John's footsteps um, in that Quinn is also dedicating, dedicated to studying state government and uh, the way state governments work and government law. So um, I am going to now turn things over to one of our fabulous students, Sean Peterson, who will introduce our speaker. Hello, my name is Sean Peterson. I'm a 3L at Widener Commonwealth and a fellow in the Patrick J. Murphy um, Fellowship, which is part of the Law and Government Institute here at Widener. First of all, I wanna say thank you all so much for attending the John Gidded Lecture Series and supporting the Law and Government Institute here at Widener Commonwealth. I know both Professor Family and Professor Teplitz have put a lot of work into setting this lecture up. Um, throughout this lecture, you will hear from Professor Miriam uh, Seifter. There will be time for questions at the end. And if you have questions um, at that time, please feel free to raise your hand virtually and we will call on you um, in the order you raise your hands to ask your question. Uh, Miriam Seif Seifter is an um, Associate Professor of Law and Rowe Faculty Fellow in Regulatory Law at the University of Wisconsin Law School, where she is also faculty co-director of the State Democracy Research Initiative. Professor Seifer Seifter received a Bachelor of Arts in Magna Cum Laude from Yale University, a Master of Science with Distinction from Oxford University, and a Juris Doctorate Magna Cum Laude from Harvard Law U School, where she was an Environmental Fellow and an Art articles editor on the Harvard Law Review. After law school, she served as a law clerk for the Chief Judge Merrick Garland on the DC Circuit and for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the Supreme Court of the United States. Prior to joining the University of Wisconsin Law F Faculty, she was a visiting researcher and adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and worked in a private practice at Munger, Tolls, and Olson LLP in San Francisco. Her most recent work examines state constitutional and administrative law with a focus on challenges facing democracy at the state level, and she teaches state and local government law, administrative law, and property law. Her publications appear or are forthcoming in the Harvard Law Review, Columbia Law Review, the Michigan Law Review, and the NYU Law Review, among others. In 2017, University of Wisconsin Law students honored Professor Seifter with the Classroom Teacher of the Year Award. And in 2018, she received one of the 12 Distinguished Teaching Awards from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
For her article, Gubernatorial Administration, Seifter was named the 2017 winner of the American Constitution Society's Richard D. Kudahe Writing Competition on Regulatory and Administrative Law. Her article, Understanding State Agency Independence, won the ABA's 2020 Award for Scholarship in Administrative Law. So without further ado, Professor Miriam Seifter. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Sean, and thank you all so much for inviting me to join you today. Um, I'm pleased to be associated with your Law and Government Institute, which recognizes the importance of legal engagement with government, not just at the national level, but also at the state and local levels, and is in that sense very much in line with what I will be talking about today. Um, I'm also delighted to participate in an event that honors John Gedded and his enormous contributions to your law school and your state's legal community. Um, as I am about to share, um, hopefully this is a successful share here. Um, can you all see my slides? Okay. Um, so my talk today is entitled State Institutions and Democratic Opportunity. And I'll be making the case that state level engagement is vital to preserving American democracy. The talk is based on a draft article of the same title that's been accepted for publication in the Duke Law Journal and will come out this fall. In the meantime, the paper is available online on my SSRN page if you'd like to read more or see the footnotes and citations. With regard to the length of my talk, a quick story. Um, one of the joys of having children who are getting a little older is that my eight-year-old and I were both working on slide presentations yesterday, um, but his presentation to his class runs for approximately three minutes, um, and I've been asked to speak for about 40, to which he said, mom, that is long. So um, let me just say that although I would have loved to join you in person, and I hope to do so someday, uh, one of the advantages of Zoom is that I hope you will feel very free uh, to take stretching breaks throughout. No one should have to listen uh, to me talk for 40 minutes without a break. Now, um, before I turn to questions of democracy, I did wanna start with a background premise that I suspect this audience already knows well. In law schools and the broader legal community, we don't pay nearly enough attention to state level governance. If you survey any group of law graduates or law professors or attorneys, you'll find admirable familiarity with the Supreme Court of the United States, with Congress, with the presidency, with federal agencies and federal administrative law. But how many people have a similar depth of knowledge about their government institutions closer to home, their state system, their state courts, their state representatives, the state executive branch, and its distinctive administrative law. And yet, inattention to state institutions opens the door to opportunists, including some who may have anti-democratic ends in mind. Moreover, you cannot protect the institutions you don't see or understand. So my remarks today are part of a multi-paper set of projects that tries to center academic and popular discussion on public law at the state level. There is just no good reason that legal education and the academy can't be closely studying the state level just as we do the national level. Through my own work individually and with our new state democracy research initiative at Wisconsin, I hope to draw more attention to what's going on in the states. Um, so what does that mean for you? Well, for scholars in the audience, I hope many of you will do more of this as well. Um, for attorneys in the audience inside and outside of state and local government already attuned to these issues, you already know how important they are and I would be interested in your feedback. Um, in fact, one of the challenges of studying states is the task of trying to learn the nuances of each of them. So I would love to hear more about your experiences in the Q&A. And for law students in the audience, I hope to persuade you that focusing on states is an excellent use of your time both in your studies and in your future legal careers. Um, okay, so a jumping off point for my remarks today is that American democracy seems to be in a precarious position. As many scholars have now written about, democracy in the United States is under pressure. We had a frighteningly fraught transfer of power after the 2020 presidential election 
And those who wish to subvert democracy are taking steps that increase the threat of that occurring in 2024. Even before that, recent years have brought to the fore a series of other developments that scholars have identified as pages from the quote, authoritarian playbook. Worse still, there seems to be little that people who are still committed to democracy can do about it at the national level, even if those people constitute sizable majorities of the public. Why would that be? Well, as Professor Steve Levitsky put it in a lecture at Berkeley this year, we are trapped by our own institutions. The Senate, the Electoral College, the Supreme Court, these are not institutions that will save us, in part because these are not institutions that are themselves committed to majority rule. And so it can all start to feel like a depressing state of affairs. Majorities still want democracy, but structural features of our national government may shut them out. So what are we to do? Well, there are places in the United States where majorities can still rule. And those places are the states themselves. Most state institutions are majoritarian. They offer more of what I will refer to in this lecture as democratic opportunity. At this moment in time, these state institutions emerge as particularly important. Now, state institutions are not perfect and they alone uh, cannot offer a complete solution to what ails American democracy. So I'm not here with some magical solution or silver bullet or even a first best solution. But state institutions offer both urgently needed defensive mechanisms against an acceleration of the worst outcomes and also a springboard for the start of better outcomes. So with that in mind, here is a roadmap for the rest of my remarks today. First, and for the longest portion of my remarks, I wanna tell you what I mean by the title's reference to democratic opportunity, which I'll define as the chance for popular majorities to rule on equal terms. And I'll explain why I see more of that opportunity at the state level at present. This is, as I'll explain, a function of state constitutions, distinctive approach to democracy and to the state institutions of government that are crafted in that mold. State institutions, again, are far from perfect, uh, but they are necessary components in the preservation of democracy. In the second part, I will canvas some of the attacks that state level institutions currently face, which collectively trend against majority rule. A lot of these attacks have been documented individually, but I will try to provide a more holistic picture and look at them together. Third, and where you see the camera lens there, I'll pause to reflect a bit. What about all the arguments that majority rule is not so great or even that it's dangerous? How can we talk about the need to preserve state level democracy while also recognizing the limits of majoritarianism? And without having all of these conversations end with a sort of inconclusive shrug, I think we should at least be able to distinguish commendable constraints on majority rule from more problematic or pretextual efforts to install minority party rule. And I'll suggest a framework that might help in that direction. And then finally, I'll end with a few thoughts on what can be done. What are the tools in the proverbial toolbox? What can be done in the short and longer terms to shore up state institutions and American democracy? And in particular, what are some remedies that might be employed by state courts, by other state officials, by reformers, and just by ordinary people who care about the future of democracy. So um, let's start with the question of democratic opportunity. If we have reason to take heart, one reason is um, the widespread support for democracy in the United States, especially by the people themselves. People want democracy, it polls well. There is bipartisan opposition, to the idea that we would become something else like an autocracy. There is bipartisan opposition to the idea that our votes wouldn't count and so on. People also support a wide range of seemingly common sense policies that would bolster democracy indirectly by increasing the basic competence of government and by lessening inequality. Now, to be sure, we are living at a time when partisan hostility and animosity run hot. 
right? There is a great divide between the political parties. But still, on the very fundamentals, it sure seems like we ought to be able to preserve to democracy, uh, given the extent of support there is for it. The question then is, where can the people have their say? Where is there, to introduce the term I'll be using today, where is their democratic opportunity? So let me define my terms a bit further since each of them bears a fair amount of weight in my analysis. Um, the first term I want to describe um, is what I mean by an institution that's democratic. So by that, I mean an institution in which popular majorities rule with individuals participating on equal terms. This definition encompasses the three pillars that I will also describe in a moment as central to state constitutionalism, majority rule, popular sovereignty, and political equality. Even with democracy being what scholars refer to as an essentially contested concept, these aspects of democracy are widely agreed upon. The second term I need to define is majority rule. So for my purposes, I define an institution as satisfying or establishing majority rule when the candidate or party with the most voter support prevails, or in the case of a ballot initiatives, when the position with the most voter support prevails. Now, I should note that this definition will not be universally accepted. For some people, it wouldn't go far enough. Um, so for one, because it is measured by the participating political community, it does not directly address real problems of voter suppression or, or um, restriction. And because it does not uh, demand full-blown policy congruence between what voters want and what policies get enacted, there are also some scholars and commentators who say that it doesn't, it's not majoritarian enough. Um, but I hope that by using a sort of minimalist definition, I can at least provide a baseline for assessment. The third important term, which I'll be coming back to, is that an opportunity is not the same as a guarantee. Instead, what I want to convey is that state institutions just make more things possible for determined majorities. The problems, which I'll talk about in a minute, that have sometimes afflicted state level elections and institutions are not entirely hardwired. They are not, for example, like the United States Senate. Their contours can be subject to reform and have been subject to reform. And a final definitional note, my focus here is largely on majority and minority parties rather than other majority minority dynamics that we could talk about. Parties today form the most salient organizing principle for policymaking and political discourse. So I think it makes sense to focus on them um, uh, for the analysis. Okay, so where do all of these terms lead? Well, if the question is where can majorities committed to democracy find an opening today? The answer is subnationally. Now, some of you may already be quite familiar with differences between state and federal institutions. Um, so for those of you who are, this may be a bit of a review, um, but I just wanna say a few words on what makes national and state level government institutions so different. Um, in the paper, I refer to this as two tales of democratic opportunity. So let me start with the national level and the obstacles that exist at that level. As constitutional scholars and historians have long observed, the federal constitution is not very democratic and was not really meant to be. It turns out, for example, that there are no real avenues for national majorities to impl implement their will directly at the national level. And there are substantial headwinds when majorities try to do so through our national representative institutions. Now, critiques of this nature typically start with the United States Senate. So let me begin there. Um, by giving all states two senators, the Senate overrepresents small states. The population differences among states were actually rather minor to begin with, but today they are very large. Commonly mentioned statistics include that a resident of Wyoming has roughly 70 times the voting power of a resident of California, or that a third of the American population elects a supermajority of its senators. So that's an advantage for small states, but with the rise of modern political polarization and what political scientists refer to as the sorting 
between the two major political parties, that small size advantage also confers a partisan advantage. Because the Republican party dominates small states, while Democrats are concentrated in large states, the 50 Democratic senators today represent over 40 million more Americans than the 50 Republicans, and the GOP senators have not represented a national majority since 1996, even though they've controlled the chamber for 18 years during that time. Another institution that partly restruct, uh, obstructs majority rule is the Electoral College, right? And you've probably heard critiques along these lines um, as well. Because states' electoral college votes are based on their House and Senate representatives, the Electoral College carries forward the small state skew I've just mentioned. And it allows, as I'm sure you're aware, a candidate to win despite re receiving fewer votes overall. It also means that only a tiny fraction of American voters who happen not to be representative of the nation as a whole ultimately matter to the outcome. And some scholars find that presidents also, as a result, pursue policies that prioritize that small fraction over others. And then there's the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary, uh, nominated, of course, by the president, therefore carrying forward the skews of the Electoral College and confirmed by the Senate, uh, therefore carrying the skews I've talked about in that context, which has the potential to compound these democratic deficits. Judges might, may therefore be selected by a Senate or president or both who lacked popular support. And of course, these judges uh, are then locked in with life tenure. And finally, in the quartet of obstacles here, we appear to be more or less stuck with this arrangement because the federal constitution is so difficult to amend. We're not in a situation where we can simply change the rules to make these institutions more amenable to the will of the people. That's not an option that's realistically on the table given the processes for federal constitutional amendment. So maybe that's a bit of a review about what our national institutions look like and the, some of the challenges they pose to democratic rule. Um, things look different in the states. And I'd like to describe this in three steps. I wanna first tell you some more about state constitutions, then describe the state institutions that those constitutions shape, and then discuss what those state institutions can actually accomplish. So um, as I've put up on the slide here, state constitutions are different in their orientation towards democracy. As my co-author Jessica Bullman Posen and I explain in a recent article, in the Michigan Law Review entitled The Democracy Principle and State Constitutions, state constitutions were very much founded around ideas about democracy, defined here to include pillars of popular sovereignty, political equality, and majority rule. In that article, we document myriad provisions that most or many state constitutions have that the federal constitution doesn't. So for example, 49 states feature a popular sovereignty provision of some kind or a declaration that all power resides in the people. Every state expressly protects the right to vote with many including additional guarantees like that elections must remain free and equal or free and open. State constitutions, as I'll discuss more shortly, establish the direct election of far more officials. Roughly half of the states provide opportunities for direct democracy as a means of enacting or vetoing statutes or amending the constitution. Some also offer things like recalls and state constitutions can typically be amended far more easily than the federal constitution, allowing people to be the authors of their government on an ongoing basis. Here are uh, just a few examples of what I mean in a way that's easier to see. So from here in Pennsylvania, a popular sovereignty clause providing that all power is inherent in the people. From the state of Washington, an example of a requirement that all elections shall be free and equal. And from Arkansas, an example of a reservation to the people of the initiative power. Now, of course, as these examples suggest, parsing and applying the democracy principle in any given case will necessarily require application of that state's own provisions. But what we show in the paper is that the pattern is widely shared across states and that it, it is and was deliberate, rooted in a history of states reacting to unrepresentative actions 
and driven by waves of amendment across the states that involved conscious borrowing and copying across states so that it's sensible to speak of this as a state constitutional principle. Indeed, when it comes to the federal constitution, we rest far more on far less evidence in the document. With state constitutions so rich with provisions embracing democracy, we should think of this as a structural feature of the documents, similar or analogous to the way that we think of federalism and the separation of powers at the federal level. Even as we might sometimes disagree about which way those structural constitutional uh, features point us in a given case, we have no doubt that what we're talking about is a constitutional principle. And so it is with the democracy principle in state constitutions. So that's the first piece of the puzzle. Now, state institutions, by which I mean the institutions of state government, are shaped in that mold, right? They are, they are shaped in the mold of state constitutions commitment to democracy. So state governors, state courts, and ballot initiatives all allow the people of the state to select their representatives, or in the ballot initiative case, their policies, directly. These elections are not skewed by the presence of an electoral college or the Senate, and almost never by life tenure either. These institutions provide the people with a more direct voice without the possibility of manipulating district lines. And state legislatures, though vulnerable to minoritarian influence in some states, have usually been majoritarian too. Now, state legislatures have been sites of extreme partisan gerrymandering and geographic skews, and so they must be considered carefully, as I argue in a separate paper entitled Counter-Majoritarian Legislatures. But state legislatures do offer the advantage, compared to the federal level, of having no equivalent of the um, National Senate. So again, if the question is, where can majorities rule, the answer is largely subnational. Now, let me stress a caveat here, one that you may already be, been, uh, be thinking about. My argument is about opportunity, not guarantees. So these institutions have plenty of problems that they face, and maybe some, as I said, have already come to mind for you. For example, um, one prominent critique is that state level elections, or at least off cycle elections, like some occurring this spring, are low turnout affairs. And so the question is, well, how representative can they be if not many people are coming out to vote? Another critique is that voters just don't know as much about their state officials. And so how do they make their decisions? Well, they might be guessing or they might be relying on proxies. And if they're relying on some sort of proxy for information, they may be basing that on their impressions of a party at the national level rather than that official's performance at the state level, which is not great for accountability. With respect to ballot initiatives, there are concerns about the power of private actors or about big money, um, or about the possibility of voter confusion when phrasing is ambiguous. So these all seem to be real concerns that deserve our attention. And my claim is not to um, try to erase them. My claim is simply that very determined majorities can do something about those problems. Those problems are not entirely unchangeable or hardwired into the fabric of states or their constitutions. And it is worth our time to try to improve on these things, to do the educational and organizing work that gets people informed and interested in voting and engaging at the state level. Okay, so the third piece of the puzzle about state, uh, states and what they can accomplish, um, if states present democratic opportunity, you know, what, well, how much good can they really do? So I think that we can divide these possibilities into short-term and long-term, offensive and defensive. In the short-term, we need states to act as a defensive seawall. There are lots of defensive things that they can do to protect against election subversion. For example, governors can veto laws that would give control over re election results to partisan actors. In addition, governors in North Carolina, Michigan, Wisconsin have also recently vetoed bills that would have impeded access to the ballot or the availability of absentee ballots. Governors in other states have also been vetoing gerrymandered redistricting maps. State courts, for their part, can reject anti-democratic state statutes or extreme partisan gerrymanders. 
Several state courts have recently done just that. As you surely know, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court was a leader in identifying a state constitutional limit on extreme gerrymanders. The North Carolina Supreme Court has recently followed suit. And the Ohio Supreme Court, acting with a bipartisan majority, is currently enmeshed in a standoff with its state's redistricting commission that the court says is disregarding the commission's mandate not to favor either party. Other state actors can be important seawalls too. Level-headed secretaries of state and state elections boards or commissions can reject unlawful attempts to tamper with elections and their outcomes. And state attorneys general can leverage state justice departments to defend the right to vote. So it is therefore imperative to pay attention to the elections of all of these offices, a point that I will return to at the end. So those are some short-term defensive mechanisms. In the medium to longer term, state institutions can take more affirmative steps that can serve as a springboard for national change. Many states have used ballot initiatives, for example, to expand the franchise to formerly incarcerated people or to create independent redistricting commissions. State legislatures have taken steps to expand access for voters with disabilities, to make registration automatic or easier, or to enact many voting rights acts. Some states have also experimented with other approaches to elections like ranked choice voting. What good is all this? Obviously state by state actions don't solve everything, um, but state level steps can actually do quite a lot. They can change the Overton window of what we view as possible. They can provide language and a blueprint for states that want to follow suit. They can ratchet up pressure on states that have been hesitant to promote democracy. And they may ultimately be experiments that lead to national shifts. So that is sort of the um, happy or optimistic story about state level opportunities. Um, but there's a less sunny story playing out as well. So let me turn uh, to that now. In states across the country, these state majoritarian institutions are under attack. And I'll offer just a non-exhaustive look at some of these attacks. So first, state ballot initiatives are under attack from bills that would make them harder to get on the ballot and harder to pass. In the 2021 legislative session, the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center reported tracking 146 bills intended to change the ballot measure process. For an example, an Idaho law, SB 1110, which I'll come back to shortly, increased the signature requirement in Idaho to such an extent that it would have made ballot measures functionally impossible in the state. The second example of attacks on state level institutions involves state courts. State courts are facing challenges from a number of bills that would change how judges are selected. Um, and one example of that that I'll highlight here is an effort in something like half a dozen states, including here in Pennsylvania, to create judicial districts. Um, and the concern is that this would then open the door to, to judicial gerrymandering, inviting into the judiciary the problems we already face in state legislatures. Um, and I would love for you to tell me more about that in the Q&A. And then a third example of challenges um, comes from legislative efforts um, to remove power from popularly elected state executives. And um, this has happened particularly in the context of both public health and election administration. I should caution that in this example, whether any one of these actions is actually anti-majoritarian requires some nuanced analysis. Not all of them are. But in the most egregious cases, legislatures strip powers from popularly elected governors or attorneys general or secretaries of state and deposit that power with some other agent, someone who has a distinctive agenda, most problematically casting doubt on fair elections or creating mischief with election outcomes. Now to date, the examples of these attacks that I've offered has received some attention, but mostly individually, like within a state and particular to that state's institution. Um, I think that what we need to do is really to zoom out and see the whole picture, that across the country, these institutions are vital strongholds of majority rule, and that we should greet their erosion with some skepticism. 
So that brings me to the third portion of my remarks, um, in which I want to reflect a bit on majority rule itself. Right? So, so far I've argued that state institutions provide an important opening for preserving democracy, but that they're under attack in ways that might obstruct that. If all of that is true, why hasn't it generated more pushback? One reason may be, as I started out with today, that people are often so focused on the national level that they lose sight of problems facing their state institutions. But another problem is that any defense of democracy and majority rule in particular runs into a set of familiar counter arguments. Democracy is hard to talk about clearly. While there is certainly a long intellectual tradition that insists on majority rule as the staple of legitimate governance, there is another long-standing tradition that worries about what's often referred to as the tyranny of the majority, that worries that majorities might treat minority groups unfairly, that majorities might try to stack the deck to stay in power. The problem is that opportunists can exploit this ambiguity. If we're perennially, am perennially ambivalent about majority rule, then those who have anti-democratic ends in mind can co-opt arguments about majority's rule, majority rules problems. So in this part of my remarks, I want to just briefly ask, is there something we can say to draw some lines here? Surely democracy is not a river that floats every boat. So how can we say what's in and what's out, what's desirable and what's problematic? In the paper, I propose a framework which proposes treating majority rule at the state level, first of all, as a starting point. That's faithful to definitions of democracy, it's faithful to state constitutions, and it's all the more important given the scarcity I've described of majority rule nationally. From that starting point, I propose what I call structural tailoring, an idea that would ensure that a constraint that's placed on majorities is justified by some actual problem, not a manufactured or imagined one. From the vantage point of legal theory, the appeal here would be to say that, you know, we have a detailed scheme for how we talk about tailoring when we burden rights. Sometimes those intrusions, intrusions on rights are justified, but the constitutional framework asks why and requires the burdens to be tailored to valid objectives. My argument, the idea I propose is that we should think of something similar for burdens on democracy. The classic values that people identify as reasons to constrain majorities, sounding in the value of protecting equality and avoiding entrenchment, those are really good reasons to limit majority power. It's just that many of the limits that are proposed on majority rule wouldn't actually serve those values at all. So an analysis that could tell the difference is a worthwhile pursuit. Now, that may sound too abstract or eggheaded to do any good, especially for those of you who are not law professors, um, but I do think it reveals three very practical recurring mistakes that we should be aware of in these conversations about state level reform. So let me just list those here. The first recurring mistake is reacting to a problem in a majoritarian institution by fully replacing it with sustained institution-wide minority rule. And maybe some of the examples of um, judicial gerrymandering fit that bill. Again, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. That sort of replacement of swapping out majority rule and replacing it with institutionally systematic minority rule is no good under the framework I propose because that's no more likely to protect the values of equality or anti-entrenchment, quite, quite the opposite. The second recurring problem is offering a strong constraint on majority rule as a response to just a mere ordinary political loss where the parties remain free to compete with each other and where there's no discrimination or entrenchment afoot. I'll describe Idaho's statute uh, in a moment in that vein. And then the third recurring mistake is imposing a solution that would actually create rather than alleviate the problems of political um, inequality or entrenchment. And I think some of the examples uh, in the field of election administration would fit into that mold. So to make this more concrete, I wanna just give a brief example about a recent Idaho Supreme Court decision that I think illustrates the feasibility of clear thinking about majority rule and its limits and when those limits are and are not appropriate. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the Idaho legislature passed a bill, SB 1110, 
that would have required a threshold of signatures from all of the state's 35 legislative districts in order to get a measure, measure on the ballot. It's not that ballot initiatives are a particularly common occurrence in Idaho to begin with, um, because the preceding requirements to um, qualify for the ballot were already quite onerous. But the legislature made this push, push after um, voters successfully expanded Medicaid. In their filings and an oral argument, the legislature argued that these new burdens on the ballot initiative were important because of the risk of majority tyranny, right? The idea was without them, what would stop Idaho majorities from trampling the rights of minorities? So here's what the state's Supreme Court said. First, the court began with something that resonates with the democracy principle. The court said, we begin our constitutional analysis by recognizing that under the Idaho constitution, all political power is inherent in the people. Moreover, it is a fundamental principle that the people in adopting the Idaho constitution instituted the government to do their will. The court went on to conclude that the people's reservation of the initiative power in Article 3, Section 1 is a fundamental right. And what about that fear of majority tyranny? Well, the court didn't dismiss it, but it considered it in context. And when they looked at the context, here's what they saw. They said, if the legislature's goal is to prevent any initiative or referendum from qualifying for the ballot, then this is probably an effective tactic. But they said, we see an unmistakable pattern by the legislature of constricting the people's initiative and referendum powers after they are successfully used. And they said, in short, with respect to this concern about majority tyranny, that just doesn't seem to be what's happening here. They said the legislature has failed to demonstrate how minority rights have been trammeled by the initiative process in the state. And indeed, the most recent examples, including the Medicaid expansion I mentioned, the court said, if anything, those may have been examples of the majority of Idaho voters acting in a democratic fashion to protect minority interests when the legislature would not. So in short, this case illustrates an approach that acknowledges that there are reasons to be concerned about majority rule and sometimes reasons to impose constraints on majority institutions, um, but that we do have ways to distinguish legitimate constraints from protectual ones. Um, and some of the recent developments I mentioned in the second portion of my remarks fare poorly under that analysis. Okay, so in my last couple of minutes, I just want to um, briefly sketch out some ideas about what can be done. What tools are in the proverbial toolbox? Um, so let me offer some ideas that are options available to state courts, to reformers within state government, to organizers and to voters. So the first um, set of options is available to state courts. And um, the idea here would simply be that state courts can and should and have been um, making greater use of the democracy principle when they're considering um, majority constraints on state institutions. I think there is really substantial potential here um, and that it is not purely a function of partisan dynamics. And you see that in um, decisions from state courts um, that are not uh, ruling simply on partisan lines. The Idaho decision exemplifies this potential in the context of burdens on the ballot initiative. Recent decisions here in Pennsylvania and also Ohio and North Carolina demonstrate the potential in the context of extreme partisan gerrymandering and in the unfortunate event that a state court had to consider a contested election, the democracy principle would be extremely relevant. For those in state government who are responding to real problems with majority institutions, um, my second recommendation um, is just to consider the important role that those institutions currently play. So for example, a state legislature that is amending state laws in response to a governor who seemed to go too far during a pandemic, a takeaway is that it is better to proceed with careful incrementalism than it is to completely overhaul these state institutions. And the final set of lessons is for organizers and also for ordinary people. Um, for organizers, I hope that this project offers a useful lens and vocabulary to think about and frame attacks on state level democracy. There is an extensive interdisciplinary literature that underscores how important it is um, to talk about things in ways 
that reflect what they're actually about, right? And how the way that we convey ideas um, actually can shape what the public thinks and help them understand the stakes of different policy interventions. Um, so to the extent that particular uh, steps that I've described today are um, anti-democratic, but haven't clearly been registered that way, um, then that's an important framing change that we can make. And then finally, for people generally, um, I hope that this work is a prompt to become an attentive steward of your state institutions if you are not already. Now, knowing this audience, maybe some of you already are. Um, one thing that we have seen clearly in the aftermath of the 2020 election is that individuals have made an enormous difference at the state level. It has been responsible choices by a range of state officials of both parties, as well as nonpartisan election administrators who have really served as a bulwark for democracy. So those state level positions matter, elections for them matter. And one thing that you can do today is to educate yourself about any upcoming elections in your state and to participate in those processes. So thank you so much for your attention this afternoon, far outlasting my son's predictions. I really look forward to your questions. All right, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand in the uh, virtual raise hand feature on Zoom. Uh, Rob Tetlitz. Yes, first of all, thank you. This, this was a fascinating uh, presentation um, and I look forward to your paper. Um, you mentioned Pennsylvania a couple of times. Um, I have a question related to that. First, I, I wanna address your, your question, which was about the um, uh, potential of bringing gerrymandering into judicial elections. Um, my, my sense of that as, as someone with um, a little bit of experience in the Capitol is that may be as much about bringing a poison pill to an attempt to reform the legislative gerrymandering process or redistricting process as anything else. Um, often in Pennsylvania, um, one reform is, is defeated by an attempt to bring another so-called reform and, and sometimes reform is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, so, so that's my observation. Um, others, others may have different views on that. Um, related to that, though, I, I was just curious, you know, in, in your work, where would you put Pennsylvania, you know, on the spectrum of, of um, you know, being more democratic or less democratic or more majoritarian, less, less majoritarian? Um, you know, those of us uh, who practice in the area or are interested in state government, um, I guess, want to know whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic. Um, and, and I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for that um, interesting observation about the dynamics at play in that proposal. You know, in terms of where to put Pennsylvania, um, you know, I would put it in a set of really pivotal states that seem like they might go in any direction. Um, you know, um, uh, unlike my home state of Wisconsin, there has been obviously um, very positive, I think, innovation um, at the state court level in terms of recognizing the importance of democracy and embracing the democracy principle. Um, but you know, legislative gerrymandering has been a significant problem, um, and in a closely divided state, I mean, one of the things that I um, that I think about often in these closely divided sort of purple states is just the role of individuals, right? Because it ends up being a question of, in many cases, you know, how does one particular election go for one seat? Does it end up being an uncontested one for some reason or is it contested? And similarly, um, you know, how are the intra-party dynamics, right? Is it, is it a state that has um, a very disciplined party structure um, that is, you know, going to take a stand against anti-democratic behavior? Does it even have a few entrepreneurs who would be willing to do so? Um, or is it going to fall in line around, you know, more autocratic um, proposals? So, you know, I think you all have better answers to that question than I do, but I would say that, you know, in general, I think of Pennsylvania as just being a, a very, very critical state um, in which to work to preserve democracy because it seems sort of uh, consistent with the title of the talk, it seems like the opportunity 
is there and it just depends on sort of the mobilization of determined majorities. Uh, Ian Everhart. Hi, Professor. Thank you for a, a delightful talk. Um, I had uh, two uh, observations that I was uh, uh, interested to hear your, uh, your discussion of um, both the initiative process and the recall process, as well as constitutional amendments as uh, vehicles to, uh, for the popular will. And I guess just uh, observing recently in Pennsylvania, I think you, you alluded to this in terms of uh, pandemic or interaction with the pandemic, um, uh, there have been several constitutional amendments introduced in Pennsylvania um, that address the governor's emergency powers among others. And um, those that bypasses the governor's veto um, so the governor has no role in those. And then I'm thinking in particular in California with the recall and initiative processes, uh, not that I'm any kind of particular expert, but I understand there's uh, so many initiatives and referendums out there that it's kind of hard for the elected bodies to legislate among all the mandates in those, as well as uh, just the principle that, you know, you have just thinking of uh, a Governor Newsom elected um, by a landslide in a general election and then a moneyed interest, uh, I guess in my opinion anyway, comes in with a, a minority of signatures to get a referendum. And then you, all of a sudden you have a, you know, an off season, off year recall um, and potentially over undoing that. So um, I guess just asking for your reaction to those um, and maybe the reaction is just these are not all equally democratic in all instances. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. It's one that I am thinking a lot about. And actually, um, our research initiative at Wisconsin is starting a project to look more closely at many of the questions that you're describing. Um, because I think what you're sort of seizing upon, which I mentioned briefly in my remarks, is just that you know these are institutions that seem structured to be democratic, uh, maybe almost the epitome of democracy. And yet, in practice, it seems like some of their features could point in quite a different direction. Like, um, you know, the amendment process um, could pass amendments. I mean, not even, it, it could go even further than your example of taking away gubernatorial power. I mean, the amendment process could be used to do things that are decidedly anti-democratic. Um, and then similarly, the role of um, money in initiatives, especially in California, but certainly not only in California, um, and the use of kind of off cycle elections, um, you know, all of that I think raises important questions. So the easy response, and then I'll, I'll give you, I think the, the sort of harder one, but you know, the easy response is just to say again, that those are not um, aspects of state level democracy that are inescapable, right? That all of this, all of this, you know, the entirety of the state level is operating in a system that is to some extent malleable to the popular will. And so if there are features of state initiative process that are bad, those two can be changed. And so we're, you know, we're not locked in in this kind of like forever um, time frame as we are at the federal level. And even that is something to work with, right? That's an important thing. Um, but the harder question is, well, how would you improve upon those institutions? How would you make it so that initiatives um, uh, are better representative of the popular will? And you know, I think that that is something that scholars should be looking at closely. One question that looms large, especially in states in which initiatives typically pass, which is not the case everywhere, um, is a question about how much voters actually understand. There's actually um, there's there's some pending litigation in Wisconsin and other states about sort of what what the standard should should that be should, should be for that like how do we how do we determine if something is argumentative how do we determine if something is clear enough um, and it's it's a puzzle but it's not a puzzle that doesn't have you know any possibility of solution so different states have experimented with different things there are states in which um, state courts have to have a go at an initiative before it can get on the ballot to make sure that it's clear and non argumentative there are states in which um, aspects of the attorney gen general's office plays that role. I can imagine a role for some sort of independent commission in playing that role. Um, I also think that as with so many things at the state level, um, better and um, sort of more um, incisive journalism on state level initiatives would be welcome because, you know, sometimes 
the, um, the sort of squeakiest wheels are the, the most self-interested. Um, so I do think that there are things that scholars and others can be doing to look at those institutions and to try to work on them, um, to try to work on turnout, to try to work on information, to think about the ways that we inform voters. So all of those different things um, to ensure that the things that get passed are actually popular. Um, and then the, the very last thing I'll say on this, because I see Quinn's hand is up, but the, um, the very last thing I'll say about this is just that there's another hard question that you didn't ask, but maybe in sort of we're, we're suggesting, which is um, what if these sort of democratic institutions are sometimes used to do things that really undermine democracy? And that's a question that, you know, that has puzzled democratic theorists, right? Like what if the people in some moment of passion want to vote against democracy? And I think that the scholarly uh, consensus, and certainly my view, is that there actually are constitutional limits on that, right? That the preservation of democracy requires that one fleeting majority cannot just undo it for the rest of time. Um, but that's another thing that I think is, you know, is, is worth study and, and dialogue. Um, so yeah, so anyway, great question, long answer, but I appreciate it. Go, go right ahead. Yeah, so first off, thank you very much for an excellent conversation and a truly excellent piece as well. Um, one of the things that I think I've been struggling with in this sense, and it gets to the answer that you gave to sort of the third part of what you were talking about is, what happens when voters choose to take away some of their own power? Not necessarily going so far as to strip themselves of democracy altogether, but to do as Colorado voters did in the 2010s and raise the threshold that's required to approve a constitutional amendment or impose a geographic distribution requirement on themselves. Um, because, I mean, obviously they have the ability to do that and voters have the ability to restrain themselves. Um, and I think it gets at some of the thornier applications of defining what it means for something to be majoritarian and also defining what it means for something to be democratic. Um, I guess, how, how would you respond to a situation like that? Um, because it invokes a lot of the same principles as come up in Reclaim Idaho. Yeah, um, so you're saying something like Reclaim Idaho, but that's passed via initiative. So it, it, it's like the people, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that is like um, what I was um, sort of saying at the end of my answer to Ian's question. Um, I think a model for thinking about this is the federal Supreme Court precedent on one person, one vote that says that that can't be eliminated through popular initiative, right? In other words, um, we might sort of disagree or be fuzzy on the margins of what's in the core of democratic power, but there is some core that is just not giveable awayable. Right, that 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 it is def definitional of what it means to be a democracy, and I think that this is a place in which state constitutions are just extremely useful resources. Um, you know, you could you can obviously extract similar ideas from the federal constitution, but state constitutions are so rich with a commitment to democracy that I don't think it's a reach at all to say that you know there are some things that are just structural to that document where um, you could imagine um, striking down. And I don't know if signature limits you know, it would depend, right? There would be, um, have to be some contextual analysis. I don't know if signature limits would be the thing, but certainly a provision that says that, you know, from now on, whoever gets the least votes wins would be something that, you know, a state court would credibly say that, that we just can't do that under our state constitutional system. So although I think there are difficult boundary cases, I think there would also be easy applications that suggest that the approach um, is a fruitful one. And, um, yeah, well, maybe I'll stop there unless you have a follow up. All right, I think we have time for about one more question at the moment. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Hesse. Thank you, Sean. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Seifter for the Wonderful presentation today, very informative on um, the constitutional analysis and particularly showing how the at the state level that can influence um, how we operate our democracy. So thank you again uh, for being here. And I'd like to thank uh, John Gedit for joining us as well and, and uh, Professor Tepler, Professor Family and you Sean for putting this all together today. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs>